Chapter 4, Part 2 The revolution is made neither by the leaders for the people, nor by the people for the leaders, but by both acting together in unshakable solidarity. This solidarity is born only when the leaders witness to it by their humble, loving, and courageous, courageous encounter with the people. Not all men and women have sufficient courage for this encounter, but when they avoid encounter, they become inflexible and treat others as mere objects, instead of nurturing life. They kill life. Instead of searching for life, they flee from it. And these are oppressor characteristics. Some may think that to affirm dialogue, the encounter of women and men in the world in order to transform the world, is naively and subjectively idealistic. There is nothing, however, more real or concrete than people in the world and with the world than humans, with other humans, and some people against others as oppressing and oppressed classes. Authentic revolution attempts to transform the reality which begets this dehumanizing state of affairs. Those who in, whose interests are served by that reality cannot carry out this transformation. It must be achieved by the tyrannized with their leaders. This truth, however, must become radically consequential. That is, the leaders must incarnate it through communion with the people. In this communion, both groups grow together, and the leaders, instead of being simply self-appointed, are installed or authenticated in their praxis with the praxis of the people. Many persons, bound to a mechanistic view of reality, do not perceive that the concrete situation of individuals' conditions, their consciousness of the world, and that in turn this consciousness conditions their attitudes and their ways of dealing with reality. They think that reality can be transformed mechanistically, without posing the person's false consciousness of reality as a problem or through a revolutionary action, developing a consciousness which is less and less false. There is no historical reality which is not human. There is no history without humankind, and no history for human beings. There is only history of humanity made by the people, and as Marx pointed out, in turn making them. It is when the majorities are denied their right to participate in history as subjects that they become dominated and alienated. Thus, to supersede their condition as objects by the status of subjects, the objective of any true revolution requires that the people act as well as reflect upon the reality to be transformed. It would indeed be idealistic to affirm that, by merely reflecting an, on oppressive reality and discovering their status as objects, persons have thereby already become subjects. But while this perception in and of itself does not mean that thinkers have become subjects, it does mean, as one of my co-investigators affirmed, that they are subjects in expectancy, an expectancy which leads them to seek to solidify their new status. On the other hand, it would be a false premise to believe that activism, which is not true action, is the road to revolution. People will be truly critical if they live the plentitude of the praxis, that is, if their action encompasses a critical reflection which increasingly organizes their thinking, and thus leads them to move from a purely naive knowledge of reality to a higher level, one that enables them to perceive the causes of reality. If revolutionary leaders deny this right to the people, they impair their own capacity to think, or at least to think correctly. Revolutionary leaders cannot think without the people, nor for the people, but only with the people. The dominant elites, on the other hand, can and do think without the people, although they do not permit themselves the luxury of failing to think about the people in order to know them better and thus dominate them more efficiently. Consequently, any apparent dialogue or communication between the elites and the masses is really the depositing of communiques, whose contexts are intended to exercise a domesticating influence. Why do the dominant elites not become debilitated when they do not think with the people? Because the latter constitute their antithesis, 
their very reason for existence. If the elites were to think with the people, the contradiction would be superseded and they could no longer dominate. From the point of view of the dominators in any epoch, correct thinking presupposes the non-thinking of the people. A Mr. Giddy, later president of the Royal Society, raised objections which could be matched in every country. However speci specious in history the project might be of giving education to the laboring classes of the poor, it would be prejudicial to their morals and happiness. It would teach them to despise their lot in life instead of making them good servants in agricultural and other laborious employments. Instead of teaching them subordination, it would render them fractious and refractory, as was evident in the manufacturing countries. It would enable them to read seditious pamphlets, vicious books, and publications against Christianity. It would rather them render them insolent to their superiors, and in a few years the legislator would find it necessary to direct the strong arm of power against them. What Mr. Giddy really wanted, and what the elites of today want, although they do not denounce popular education so cynically and openly, was for the people not to think. Since the Mr. Giddies of all epochs, as an oppressor class, cannot think with the people, neither can they let the people think for themselves. The same is not true, however, of revolutionary leaders. If they do not think with the people, they become devitalized. The people are their constituent matrix, not mere objects thought of. Although revolutionary leaders may also have to think about the people in order to understand them better, this thinking differs from that of the elite, for in thinking about the people in order to liberate rather than dominate them, the leaders give of themselves to the thinking of the people. One is the thinking of the master, the other is the thinking of the comrade. Domination, by its very nature, requires only a dominant pole and a dominated pole in antithetical contradiction. Revolutionary liberation which attempts to resolve this contradiction implies the existence not only of these poles, but also of a leadership group which emerges during this attempt. This leadership group either identifies itself with the oppressed state of the people, or it is not a revolutionary, or it is not revolutionary. To simply think about the people, as the dominators do, without any self-giving in that thought, to fail to think with the people is a sure way to cease being revolutionary leaders. In the process of, of oppression, the elites must, the elites subsist on the living death of the oppressed and find their authentication in the vertical relationship between themselves and the latter. In the revolutionary process, there is only one way for the emerging leaders to achieve authenticity. They must die in order to be reborn through and with the oppressed. We can legitimately say that in the process of oppression, someone oppresses someone else. We cannot say that in the process of revolution, someone liberates someone else, nor yet that someone liberates himself, but rather that human beings in communion liberate each other. This affirmation is not meant to undervalue the importance of revolutionary leaders, but on the contrary, to emphasize their value. What could be more important than to live and work with the oppressed, with the rejects of life, with the wretched of the earth? In this communion, the revolutionary leaders should find not only that their raison d'etre, but a motive for rejoicing. By their very nature, revolutionary leaders can do what the dominant elites, by their very nature, are unable to do in authentic terms. Every approach to the oppressed by the elites as a class is couched in terms of the false generosity described in chapter 1. But the revolutionary leaders cannot be falsely generous, nor can they manipulate. Whereas the oppressor elites flourish by trampling the people underfoot, the revolutionary leaders can flourish only in communion with the people. Thus, it is that the activity of the oppressor cannot be humanist, while that of the revolutionary is necessarily so. End of chapter 4, part 2